So welcome uh, for this morning lecture on introduction to the nitrogen cycle. So my name is uh, Ralf Kiese. I'm working in this institute. Uh, I'm head of the working group ecosystem metafluxes. And we are dealing mostly with nitrogen, but for sure also with carbon and greenhouse gas emissions. So what you can see already on this slide is that nitrogen, <coughs> that, um, the, 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 the synonym is, is this N here, is, is putting threats to the environment. And nitrogen is quite a complex issue. You see here uh, industry, we see agriculture putting fertilizer, and this could be some natural systems, and this is all somehow interlinked. So with this big N in the middle, um, the subtitle of this talk could also be nitrogen too much of a good thing. So, And that's kind of the issue what we deal with in the next one hour. So if you look to a publication by Ruckström et al. published in Nature 2009, indeed nitrogen was identified as one of the most important threats uh, to the Earth at the moment, and this is uh, uh, under this kind of keyboards, planetary boundaries. There is uh, for sure climate change, but if you see, uh, not as important as the nitrogen uh, perturbation, and there is this biodiversity losses. But we will see later on that nitrogen is also linked to climate change and to biodiversity, so they are all uh, kind of linked. Now, if we look to the outline of the talk, so I will talk about first about nitrogen. We need to see the components and the reservoirs because that's important to understand uh, the global nitrogen cycle. So we go from the natural cycle then uh, towards uh, human perturbation and the consequences. And uh, in the second part of the talk, I will give some examples. It's basically on work what we do here, field studies and also biogeochemical modeling. And then at the end, there will be a summary and some conclusions. Now, if we look to the reservoirs and components, we see there's a lot of nose, which means this is not reactive. So we have nitrogen in the mantle and in the crust, which is not reactive, and we have it in the atmosphere because 78% of the atmosphere is N2, but unluckily this N2 has a, a triple bound, so which fixes the two components very much together, so it's non-reactive. So that means we have 50% of the availability to the ecosystems in the atmosphere, but this is not reactive. Um, then if you look on soils, there's a little bit more, um, but the turnover times are rather low, and then we have the, the biosphere, either marine or terrestrial, where we have lower turnover times, but the reservoirs in, in the so-called terrestrial ecosystems is rather small compared to soils and to these non-reactive uh, uh, parts in the, in the atmosphere. What is also important is that the Earth's nitrogen stocks, they stay constant, but the chemical forms uh, can vary. And this is bringing me to the keyword of reactive nitrogen, because we need this reactive nitrogen. Uh, and if you just look on the reactive nitrogen, then we have these components, uh, for example, nitrate, which can be transported in water, uh, and nitrate. Then we have uh, a laughing gas. N2O, which is, a, which is a gas, and we have ammonia, and we have all organic forms, and here you see examples of amino acids. So this reactive nitrogen, this is the main component when we talk about ecosystem processes, and this reactive nitrogen is influencing process in plants, in soils, in water bodies, and also in the atmosphere, and is essential for the distribution in the environment. So we will just have a look to this later on. Now, if we start again with the global nitrogen cycle, the natural nitrogen cycle, then we have this huge reservoir in, in the atmosphere. So now um, um, we need to get this nitrogen into, e in the, into the ecosystems. And I was talking about that this three uh, uh, triple bonds is quite stable. So with lightning, we can oxidize it. And lightning is one of the pathways, which is natural deposition, to get nitrogen into either aquatic or terrestrial ecosystems. The other way is what you might have heard is nitrogen-fixing bacteria on roots and in soil. So we have non-symbiotic, uh, which could be, say, cyanobacteria, but symbiotic. That's just a picture here where we have uh, bacteria associated to roots. And they fix nitrogen, the N2, and they bring it into, into ammonia. Um, what is quite interesting is that this uh, bacteria, they live or the, 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 the fixing does work only without oxygen. And this is going back to the time when the Earth didn't have oxygen in the, in the atmosphere. 
So before the plants could kind of develop, there was already this bacteria fixing nitrogen out of an atmosphere with oxygen. So this is one of the limitations because we have oxygen now that these uh, uh, microbes, they, they need to, to save their place where they do this fixation out of oxygen. Now with ammonia, uh, we can feed plants with it or the plants take this as a, as a macronutrient. But then we have from ammonia, we have nitrification, which is an aerobic process which converts uh, ammonia or ammonium into, into nitrate. And um, this is taking place in the soil, but like I said, nitrate is uh, highly soluble in water, so we can transport this also in aquatic ecosystems. Now, nitrate can be also taken up by plants as ammonia, but nitrate uh, in the process of denitrification, which is a strict anaerobic process, can be converted back into N2. So there's a, there's a few steps in denitrification. The last step is N2, and ideally we just get the N2 then back into the atmosphere, and that's the, that's the cycle. Um, natural cycle, like I said, very important is that the only two pathways getting nitrogen is, is nitrogen fixation and lightning. And nitrogen fixation is about, uh, uh, it can be, if you have acacia, as 150 kilogram N per hectare, but uh, uh, so a natural kind of uh, 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 forest ecosystem which doesn't have this uh, symbiotic uh, nitrogen fixation is about 5 to 10 kilograms. So it's rather low amounts and lightning might be about 2 to 3 kilograms. So now, if we take this further, we do now fertilization. So we want to grow plants and fertilization rates are going up to 100, 200, 300, 500 kilograms. So we add a lot of nitrogen. Then this uh, is going again in the ammonia pool and then we start the whole cycle again so that we uh, uh, get also the plants fed by animals and from this kind of production we produce waste and residues which are in organic form and if they are mineralized we get again into the ammonia pool and then we can kind of speed up the whole cycle. And finally uh, what is important like I said uh, the denitrification is not only producing N2 but also N2O and this is a potent greenhouse gas. So this is somehow the relation um, of the global nitrogen cycle, the natural one with very low inputs and kind of the perturbation where we have high inputs. Now if we, if we just uh, keep in mind that denitrification and nitrification are the most important processes in terrestrial ecosystems, they, they uh, mostly happen in the soil. Um, this is a very simplified uh, 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 scheme of the nitrogen cycle. So what we know nowadays, and this is just, this is the, the, the nitrification and this is the denitrification, there's a whole bunch of, of, of more processes. And what you see is also that we have organic ammonium, this is hydroxylamine, nitrate, nitrate, and, and all these kind of forms. And they can be produced uh, in, in, in oxidative processes, but also again produced in redu reductive processes. And you can somehow also see that something which is produced here can be taken up by another process. So what I do not want to go very much into detail is just that nitrogen cycling is very, very complex in compared to carbon cycle, for example, where you have respiration and photosynthesis and you have organic and CO2. So there's, there's a lot more in the nitrogen cycle. And um, we, we know about this by molecular uh, uh, methods and also we can screen DNA so that we get some ideas, but we are very, very far away to really understand this, this whole cycle. I'm talking later on about models and, and how we, what, we, what we take into account in the models, because in the models we cannot take all these processes. And some of them are of, of sometimes also of minor importance. Now, just to, to human perturbation, and this is also kind of an, 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 an yeah, looking back about uh, understanding nitrogen cycling uh, in, in a historical way. If we go back to 1836, we have Jean-Baptiste Bossignon, and he was the first uh, on, on the planet kind of realizing that nitrogen is an important uh, uh, component for plant growth. And if we, if we go further, then we have some Germans here in 1888 and uh, these guys were the first one who realized that bacteria can do this nitrogen fixation by legumes and this was then also already implemented into, into agriculture. What you, what, you, what you see here is, this is the population 
um, 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 here just uh, uh, numbers of, of people. If we go further on, then there was this guy, Sir William Crookes, he was the president of the British Association, Association for the Advancement of Sciences, and he was in 1900 realizing that this nitrogen is limiting and that the world is running out of nitrogen. So if there's no other process than this biological nitrogen fixation, still the population is rather low. And then we kind of exploded the whole system with again two German guys, Fritz Haber and Karl Bosch, which were just uh, um, getting Nobel Prizes also because they, they, they uh, developed a method to do uh, uh, produce nitrogen fertilizer out of the atmosphere again too. And now the whole situation changed completely because if you look now, this is the start of the, 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 the Harbour Bosch here. This is the, the chemical uh, nitrogen production and with this we could really increase the population. But you see also that, that the, 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 the nitrogen inputs to kind of, if you want, natural situation has dramatically increased we could increase at the same time the population. Now, if we, if we look on this, what, what does this mean in numbers? This is just a different scheme showing the same thing. This is the world population increase and this is the average fertilizer input increase from 1900 to 2000. And if we look now, this is the world population if we wouldn't have Harbour Bush. So it would be only 30% uh, 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 of what we have now. And um, um, if you take the number further, that means at the same time that at the moment 50% of the world population relies on the, the Harbour Bosch uh, uh, synthetization of the, of, the, of the nitrogen. World population. I didn't really look this one up, so I, I could I could check, but most likely they just did a difference to to what you have with Harbour Bosch. It, it doesn't really fit because you have 50% and the 30%. It doesn't get to 100. So, good good question. But the the, the main message is that 50% of the current population is really fed by Harbour Bosch. Ah, this is this is um, um, people realize that nitrogen is the threat to 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 an environment, and there is some kind of uh, uh, reduction in 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 fertilizer input, more efficient agriculture. So that's one of the reasons why it might not increase at the moment. But you need to take into account that there's many countries, for example, in Africa. We talk about the situation in, in, in Europe and Asia. In Africa, there's almost no fertilizer applications at the moment. So from that point of view, um, there's really these this two bolts in terms of nitrogen perturbation because in Africa, we still have two less nitrogen for, for increasing uh, crop production. Okay, so le let's go further. Um, if, you, if, you, if you look on these numbers here, this is just the, the, the increase in synthetic fertilizer. These are numbers now for the EU and you see just in 1900 that most of the, 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 the fixed nitrogen was by, this by, uh, by legumes, uh, which is in line with the, the slides before. And then we have increased dramatically the, the, the synthetic fertilizer applications. Um, this is N2 fixed by industry and traffic. This is combustion processes. And what we have also in Europe is that because we have this high uh, um, um, animal production systems, so we need to import uh, um, um, crops to feed the animals, for example, from Brazil. And with this crop, we need not only take carbon into uh, our uh, uh, markets, but also nitrogen. And this is, this is just a very important one just by, by global transfer of, of, of nitrogen stocks. And what you see is that we more or less have kind of uh, four times higher inputs in, in Europe as we uh, had in, in, in 1900. So now this is again a scheme showing that nitrogen cycle is very complex. We talked about these components. We have gases forms. We have nitrogen, which can sp which can be transported. And if we just take uh, the example of, of of fertilization here, then we have this turnover process. But you see, there can be with fertilization, we can have also ammonia volatilization in the atmosphere. 
then we can get redeposition uh, uh, with, with rainfall um, in, in oxidized or in, 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 in reductive forms. We can have this, this, this nitrate uh, transportation into aquatic bodies. And, and so, so we have this so-called nitrogen cascade. So that's the problem of the nitrogen. Once you apply it on a single field, it won't stay there. Everything which is not taken up can be either transported via the air and redeposited or via, via the water. And then we kind of interlink this, this, this uh, intensively managed systems with uh, also uh, um, 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 native systems wi which haven't had this high amount of nitrogen. And then we cause all these problems. If you if you look on, on the EU, so this is the slide I showed before, we, we are now here and this is the losses. So you see what we see that the losses have increased from 1900 to 2000. And again, what you see here, I just talked about, this is the nitrate transported into water bodies. Uh, it's more or less about the half. Then we have N2O emissions, which are rather small compared ammonia volatilization, which is driving the, the redeposition uh, mostly and, and the combustion processes, which are also involved in the, in the redeposition. Now, why, why is the nitrogen not completely taken up? So this is, this is just a, a, a balance what I uh, uh, did uh, from Europe. You see here the, the different countries of Europe and this is Germany here. Um, this is the Netherlands, and uh, so we see that Germany at the moment, this is numbers from 2005 to 2008, is applying in average 215 kilogram of, of nitrogen per hectare. You see the Netherlands, they do a little bit more. Um, but if we now compare um, how much is harvested, so how much is basically taken up by the plants, then we see it's only 125 kilograms of nitrogen. So if we do now the difference, we have 90 kilograms which is staying in the environment and which is kind of prone to be transported around. So we talk about an efficiency of 60%. So in a, in, a, in a production process, this is a very, very low number, but we talk about biological processes. Nevertheless, that's <coughs> indicating if we have a 60% efficiency that we might can do something to increase this efficiency and then we would have less export into the environment. Now, we take this a little bit further, and this is now not uh, numbers in kilograms, this is just normalized to percent. So we have 100% fertilizer input, we have 60% efficiency with, with crop harvest, so that means we have 40% of losses, um, which is just uh, mixed up here, so it should be just the other way around. So any guess from you how these numbers, like um, the, 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 the losses, the red number, will develop over here. Do you have any idea? Will, will this be lower numbers, as high, or do you have any ideas? It's a little bit shocking because if you look at this, then if you, for example, eat beef, then from the 100% of nitrogen which was fertilized, it's only ending up below 10% in the product. So m more than 90% stays in the environment. It's a little bit better for poultry, X, but also dairy products are, are not so very good. So that means that is already indicating a little bit towards that one thing what one could do is just thinking about the diet. So vegetarians are doing much better than if you eat beef all the time. At the last column, you see the, the global agriculture. So in, I mean, Europe is, is a quite developed uh, uh, part of the world. In global agriculture, we have an efficiency of, of, of 40%. So here was the 60 percent. Now the consequences, like I said, the, the nitrogen is not staying in the environment and we have this, this, this nitrogen deposition and in Germany or everywhere in the world uh, a natural nitrogen deposition number was about five to eight kilograms per hectare in year. If you look now to these numbers then, then we have, this is going up to 70 kilograms uh, um, and what you see here is, is just, this is the place where we do this intensive uh, 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 animal product, where we have this intensive animal production systems. So we have all this menu there, it's volatilized and the ammonia is just redeposited. So that means even if you are very close to one of these farms, the, the, the deposition can go up to 100, 250 kilograms, which is in the same range as what we fertilize our agricultural fields. And if you think about that, there is a forest nearby there is indeed consequences uh, uh, not only to the kind of nitrogen cycle of, of components but also to biodiversity issues. What you see as well is that 
um, it, it also depends on the on the surface uh, what you what you have uh, of of the trees. So conifers have all year round uh, needle uh, needles. The the, the broadleaves throw it away. So we are getting a little bit lower numbers. Same in naturalist grasslands and shrublands. There's a, a lower surface, so the deposition is is then a little bit lower. Now this is a, a summary of what, what I talked about. So all the threats what we what we have if we have this excess nitrogen, um, we can get this uh, increased uh, N2O emissions, which is a greenhouse gas. So this is kind of the climatic aspect. I talked a little bit about uh, ecosystems and and biodiversity. Um, we can have problems with, with, with water quality. That's it could be in biodiversity aspect, but also nitro. This is polluting drinking water. Um, air quality, NOx is involved in, in oso ozone production, so that's also one thing where the nitrogen cycle is linked to. And in soils, uh, we can have acidification. If you put ammonia and this is converted to nitrate, then there is one proton staying in the soil, um, which is compensated by an export of, of magnesium or potassium or, or kalium, so just by a, by a base cation. So this is why farmers sometimes put lime onto their fields to increase the pH again. So this is kind of the summary of these environmental issues. Uh, now, this is the last slide for the first part of the talk, um, is that if we put costs on it, um, then uh, um, we see that, for example, this human health uh, um, due to ozone and, and particular matter, uh, small particles, it's about 10 to 30 kilograms, and and other uh, issues like climate change is about 5 to 15. It's, it's quite tough to get these numbers, but anyway, there was a, a, a some people trying to do this. The important thing is even if there is high high un un uncertainties, uh, if you compare this to the price what fertilizer is, then one kilogram of N is approximately 1.5 euros. So to buy fertilizer in total is much cheaper than any prices what we see here, what we have for the costs. So this is this is going a little bit into this uh, debate if the nitrogen fertilizers are too small because they are one of the troublemakers of, of all of these environmental uh, issues and some people even think about that we should put tax on but then food prices will increase and the question still then is for us if we will accept this. So at the moment there is really no action going into that. But I think it's important to just to tell that the product what you buy is much cheaper then all the costs what what you what you get with it. Good. So I'm going now to to the examples and and I just like want to to link this again with the terrestrial nitrogen cycle. Um, this was kind of tackled by some slides before, but we have basically organic matter which is fed by plant litter production and death of microbes. And with ammonification, we get ammonia. Nitrification, we turn it into nitrate, and denitrification is turning it into ideally N2, but it could be also N2 and NO. These gases. What is important that we have always the plants and the microbes in the soil. They are competing for this, for this, for this, for this nitrogen stocks there. So that means, for example, if we cut out the, the, the plants, then we have access for the microbes and then they can turn it over and we might increase into emissions. And I will give some examples. The same uh, is, 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 is true um, for, for, for nitrate leaching here. And again, like I said, the perturbation happens due to increased atmospheric end deposition and fertilization rates. Uh, and in, in the original form, we had only this N2 fixation by microbial biomass. Good. Um, and to, to make it complete, this is in, in agriculture, if you put ammonium fertilizer, this can volatilize uh, into uh, ammonia. Now, um, first, s uh, a positive uh, uh, um, impact because forests are nitrogen limited and um, if you just look over all places of Europe and there was a lot of green color also in the deposition map of Germany so it's not everywhere that we have these really extraordinary high depositions so that means we are still stimulating forest growth by this additional nitrogen coming from uh, uh, deposition. So this was an, an, an effort by uh, colleagues uh, Wim de Friesedal who just recently published this paper and they calculated the, the increase in, in forest growth just uh, by using CN ratios. So what you, what you just use basically is a function of available nitrogen. This is indicated here that 
only 25% of the deposition will stay in the ecosystem. This is true for the for boreal forests and temperate forests and in tropical forests it's even lower because for example we have higher denitrification and we produce more uh, gases losses. And then you look into allocation fractions which basically says how much nitrogen and this is linked to the carbon uh, if you have for the, for the synthesis is put into stems, into coarse woods, into woody parts and all these other components. And what we can measure is the CN ratio of all, this all of these components. And with this, we can then calculate, and this is the table here, that for any kilogram of nitrogen, we can uh, 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 fix 21 kilograms of carbon, which will finally end up in the stems. And what you see as well here in the soil, for example, this is due to increased little production. One kilogram is uh, uh, resp nitrogen resp is responsible for about 13 kilogram of carbon which will be uh, sequestered in the soil. So if you if you extrapolate this for the for the for the whole whole Europe situation with nitrogen nitrogen deposition maps, then we are coming uh, at the current deposition uh, scenario to about 300 teragrams C per year. 60% is, is sequestered additionally in the wood and 40% in the soil. This is about three to eight percent of the the, the global. Uh, of of the the European so that's wrong European forest uh, uh, net ecosystem productivity, so a rather small number. I'm just putting this because there were some publications they used different approaches and they came up to to numbers of 30, 40 percent. So, but there's some evidence also by more field studies using stable isotopes that that we talk about this below 10 percent. Nevertheless, significant. One thing what we need to take into account is that um, um, this is the current situation and this N1, N2, N3 are different status of, 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 of saturation. So here we are, we have still a high retention efficiency, which was the 25% what I've said, but if we add more and more nitrogen, this efficiency will, will go down and un until we reach N3, where we have really a saturation. And if it goes below zero, that means we will might have even a, red, a net release of, of, of nitrogen out of these ecosystems. This is translated into uh, the, the net primary productivity, the, if you want, the, the, the forest growth, so that you see under this kind of nitrogen limited conditions where we mostly still are in most of the systems, we have this increase, but if we get into saturation, the response curve is going down. So that means the 7-8% of increase are valid for, for, for this situation, but if we continue with this higher nitrogen depositions, this effect will, 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 will level out over time. Good, field studies. Um, this is our own kind of long-term uh, uh, site. This is a, a, a spruce forest and it has uh, some, some oh, uh, the number is down here, uh, the, the nitrogen deposition is around 30 kilograms. So this is this is already quite quite a significant uh, number. So we are close to to nitrogen saturation. So there is a lot of uh, nitrate leaching. And what what we investigated here is, is now a little bit linked to 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 land use change, if you want, and in in that case more to forest management. So what happens with NTO emissions and nitrate leaching if you do a selective cutting or if you do a clear cut? And we have investigated that for for quite a long time. What you see is the the black dots is the control the green dots is the selective cutting and the red dots is the clear cut so the clear cut has happened here and what you see is that until 2006 where the treatments are just at the same level again clear cut selective cutting and and the control the uh, N2O emissions because we kind of cut this competition between microbes and uh, uh, the forests on this on this nitrogen components and two emissions have increased dramatically. The same is if you look here for 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 nitrate uh, uh, leaching, but the time axis is a little bit different, so we are just going going up here. So this is um, and if you take this into account, then then there's carbon sequestered, and if we do a full greenhouse gas balance, and we do not account only for the CO2, but we would include N2O then this kind of, uh, if you want, five, six years will reduce the, 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 the CO2 uh, uh, sequestration by 20 to 30 percent, which is quite a significant number because N2O is a quite potent greenhouse gas. 
Now, um, this is a, another field study. This uh, N2O emissions, uh, in our case, we are measuring them with chambers. So you close the chambers and then you can measure the increase of gas concentrations and then just by, by the, the, the slope of the increase uh, you finally get the, 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 the numbers. Um, and this is uh, an example over one and a half years on a, uh, on a maize field. Blue is without fertilization and we just see here that the emissions are much smaller uh, compared to the, to, the, to the fertilized treatments. In Hügelwald, before the slide, we had emissions up to 300 micrograms per square meter an hour. In these agricultural systems, we are here with six, 700, but that can go even up to 1,000, 2,000, just because we add more nitrogen. Now, this numbers in Germany is that 6% of the total greenhouse gas emissions are caused by N2O. And the most important thing is that agriculture contributes to about 70%. So there's a high mitigation pot potential in, in agriculture. And this is what we investigate. And you can use, for example, inhibitors, which are kind of uh, uh, reducing um, ammonia volatilization. This is, this is just the, the treatment here um, that this one is reducing ammonia volatilization, and this is now the cumulative, cumulative uh, N2O emissions. This is the control, and like with this reduction of ammonia volatilization, we have achieved something um, that we get less ammonia into the atmosphere, but that means on the other side that more nitrogen is staying in the soil, so that means overall the N2O emissions are higher than. So, and there's another treatment, which is, which is this one down here, which is 70% of fertilizer application to, to the normal one. And this was also 100%. So we re reduced the fertilizer application by 30%. And we used this uh, uh, ammonia volatilization reduction. And then we are indeed lower than the, the, uh, the, the control treatment and we got almost to the same yields. So the message is if we use um, um, inhibitors then and we, we, we increase with this the availability of nitrogen in the soil, we most likely need to reduce fertilization rates. Otherwise, we will keep more nitrogen in, 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 in the soil so we won't have ammonia volatiliz volatilization. But at the same time, we would produce more N2O, which is another harmful substance. Now to biogeochemical modeling. So this is just a scheme about how biogeochemical models works. In our uh, uh, group, we use the landscape, the NDC model. In principle, you use just uh, ecological drivers, climate, soil, vegetation, human impact. You have a plant growth module. This can be either for arable grassland or forest. Then you calculate soil climate as temperature, soil moisture, mineralization, which gives the substrates of carbon and nitrogen with soil temperature, soil moisture, and pH, then we drive this process in the nitrogen cycle of nitrification and denitrification. Because this is an anaerobic process and this is anaerobic, we have this anaerobic balloon, which just tells us uh, from the oxygen concentration what we calculate, how much is anaerobic and how much is aerobic, and then we split between these two processes. And finally, we can calculate nitrate leaching and all these uh, kind of emissions. <coughs> also. Uh, how much the, the forest or the, the is growing and how much yields we can produce. So quite uh, yeah, general scheme of, of any kind of process-based ecosystem model. What can you do with it? Um, this is now uh, arable site, GBC in Germany. This is a grassland site in Unsingen. This is measured soil temperature uh, and, and simulated uh, rainfall. This is the soil moisture. In that case, there are some problems with the model, red is simulated, but in that case it's better. And then if we have measurements, this is the plant uh, biomass produced, matches very well. This is ammonium nitrate concentrations here, always the dots are the measurements and the line is the, the simulation. It fits also quite well and if you look on the numbers, um, they, are, they are at least for N2O quite, quite different. So we have much higher N2O emissions from this grassland field because we put more, more uh, fertilizer compared um, to, to this one. So what we do then with this, this model that this is the, the side scale validation and if we have 10, 15, 20 of these data sets, there's not that much more in the world where we have all these com components measured and we have this from different kind of uh, soils and climates, then we can be somehow sure that if we use the model in an in a upscaling approach um, or in scenarios that, that we are not doing that wrong. So 
one thing was in, in reducing nitrogen uh, or N2O emissions by, by inhibitors. Another example, this is uh, a, a study what we have done in South Korea. What you see here is in Germany the, the, the average fertilization application was about 200 kilograms. Here we have 300 and with the model it's much higher. We could just show that keeping the same yields um, we can reduce the fertilizer for cabbage from 300 to, to 120 kilograms because they, this is just, they have very small fields and they have one bag of fertilizer and they just put the bag of fertilizer to a small field because they don't want to carry it back. That's the simple reason why it's over fertilized. And with this model, we, we, we have a chance to give some evidence. What we could also do is that they do one uh, application just once a year. So if you do two splits, if you divide it, this is more kind of demand uh, uh, driven fertilization. That's also helping to induce, but we could also see if we do three splits, then the, 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 the reduction in, 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 in nitrogen emissions is not so very helpful. This is a specific situation there. So you can evalu evaluate with this model uh, agricultural management suitable to the given conditions what you have at the site. Um, field studies, nitrate leaching. Um, this was now an, an spatial extrapolation where we used our model uh, for, for whole Germany. And you see here nitrate leaching is, is this is just uh, the spatial distribution. We have at some sites nitrate leaching which is exceeding uh, 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 40 kilograms, which is in the same range what arables can be. And uh, in mean nitrate leaching rates was about 5.5 kilogram. But we get this elevated uh, uh, um, emissions already uh, if we put more than 15 to 20 kilograms. And we have this strong correlation of nitrogen deposition and, and nitrate leaching. The highest rates uh, uh, we found at uh, uh, sites where the forest floor CN ratio is smaller than 25%. So th again, the CN ratio, like I said, the more narrow it is, the more nitrogen rich it is. And the 25% seems to be a threshold for nitrate leaching and N2O emissions. So that's also an indication if you measure out in the field and your forest has a CN ratio of 30, then it, it's, it's okay in terms of nitrogen. If you go below 25, then this is pointing towards uh, uh, saturation of an ecosystem, of a forest ecosystem. Um, it's sometimes difficult to, to, to validate the simulations. We have done this in that case with some measurements, which was done in Bavaria, and we couldn't really go to the specific points, but uh, if you make classes of nitrate leaching 0 to 5, 5 to 15, and larger than 15, then you see the, the measure is the, the, the red color, and this is kind of the, the red pattern that we quite match quite nicely for, for, for Bavaria, which was somehow also a, a, a validation that uh, the, the model applications seem to be all right and could be used maybe for some um, further guidance. Um, I think I just skip uh, this one. Um, this, this was a little bit of biodiversity uh, aspect. So what you can do as well is now, like I said, if we have this enrichment of, of, of nitrogen, um, and this is again indicated here with the CN ratio and also base saturation. So if you look on, on, on plant communities, and this is just different plant communities, um, this, this might have been 50 years ago, the, 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 the plant community uh, on a given site. No, it's, it's this way. This way. This was 50 years ago where we had this, this uh, wide CN ratios and the, the, uh, and the given base saturation. And now with nitrogen deposition scenarios, we can use our model to calculate the change in CN ratio and in base saturation. And, and then you can kind of, uh, uh, um, for example, for this ecosystem, if you go out of this kind of green area, it's not stable anymore. So with this and biodiversity models with an ecosystem or biogeochemical ecosystem model and bio linking to biodiversity models, we can somehow uh, calculate shifts in biodiversity. And, and if you want to go into management, you could even say that uh, a, 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 a yeah, a species community here, if you have now, uh, if it was this one and we are now here in this range, then you can give foresters, if you want, some ideas which plant might grow better or not. Um, field studies, again, this is climate, uh, 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 this, this before was uh, nitrate leaching and, and biodiversity. 
Um, this is a, a study we have done in, in a, a forest in, in Austria together with, with the Environmental Protecting Agency in Vienna. And what you see again here is uh, that we have after clear cuts this elevated nitrogen leachings. And always if there is forest thinnings, we also increase nitrate leaching. Um, then um, um, with the uh, re reinitiation of the understory, with increased uh, forest growth, we get to, 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 to lower uh, uh, nitrate leaching rates. And once the forest uh, uh, reaches maternity and then the growth is, is smaller, then again, we get some uh, uh, higher nitrate concentrations in the seepage water. Overall, these concentrations are not so very high. And the motivation of this study was this is a karst region. And uh, um, they just wanted to know if forest management is uh, uh, putting uh, harms to nitro concentration in drinking water because in the karst environment you have very uh, 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 um, uh, fast water flows and uh, the soils cannot capture out the, the, the nitro efficiently. And if you if you look on on on, on climate change. Uh, what you see then is uh, this is a climate change scenario and this is just the difference between the, the current and the climate change is that climate change will increase the, the nitrate uh, export um, just when you, when you do um, uh, this, this kind of uh, uh, clear cut. Um, then we have summer droughts, this is, this is uh, in the second phase which are somehow delaying the re of the of the, the the young forest, which is also then causing higher uh, nitrate concentrations uh, compared to the current situation. And in, in the mature status, we are below the line, so we are having less nitrate leaching because under climate change conditions in that forest, it's a, a mountainous forest, the forests are growing faster. So the message is that climate change is not really making the nitrate leaching problematic in these forests. Uh, uh, very well is that there must be some ac activity. So, good. Now, um, the world is the simulations have been all one dimensional, and uh, the problem is that the world is not one dimensional. One dimensional means we just simulate one column and there is no interaction. If we if we go to these slopes, then we have lateral transports of nitrates, and if we do just one column, then this is just not really the truth. And you can also imagine there's kind of farms that we can have this, this uh, uh, volatilization of nitrogen. It can be redeposited in these riparian zones, etc. So patchwork of land uses with, uh, we have patchworks of land uses with own uh, reactive nitrogen sink and, and source characteristics. In, in such landscapes, and that's also in the landscapes where we live, uh, this nitrogen is highly managed. It's transferred, emitted, and redeposited. And uh, we have intensive uh, interactions and transformations at landscape uh, elements. And this is one thing very roughly now um, that we are at the moment linking our biogeochemical model, the nitrogen part, to hydrological models that we can really uh, uh, calculate this, this transport. And you could even take it further. You can also link our models uh, to atmospheric models, which then calculate redeposition. So that's at the moment one direction what we go for. So you have a, a hydrological model and a biogeochemical model, and they just uh, uh, talk to each other. And then you can uh, run it on a landscape scale. I might just go very quickly over this one. So we have the metrology. Um, and with the, with the hydrological model, we get the soil hydrology, for example, water contents, depending on, on, on landscape position, lateral flows. And this is a, a catchment, and this is just indicating the, 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 the water flows with these with this arrows now. And what we can now just calculate is here nitrate turnover, nitrate concentrations. And with, again, the hydrological model, we can calculate this, this nitrate leaching. So if we cut through this, uh, uh, this slope here, then one thing what you, what you could do, this is just now a, a, a kind of a virtual hill slope. Basically, what you see here, if we fertilize the arable fields, we increase the nitrate uh, in, in the soil, which can be transported laterally down to the riparian zone. And then we can, for example, this is N2O here, we can get N2O emissions, which is not N2O emissions because fertilization here, it's because fertilization up the hill and transportation of nitrates into riparian zones. You could even think about how to 
design riparian zones that we can just catch up all the import of nitrogen that we minimize this N2 emissions or the nitrogen export into the aquatic system. Now, um, towards the very last slides, um, this is also a landscape and validation of these models on landscape scale is, is also quite tough because you need a lot of measurements. What you can use is stable isotopes and the, 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 the very simple message is that always if you have a turnover, the heavy stable isotope, the heavy form in terms of nitro nitrogen, we have 14N and 15N, the, the 15N will stay in the soil and if you have gas uh, export, um, the, the, the lighter fractions will, will go. So that's just indicated by the colors. The atmosphere has uh, a, a signature of zero. So that means if we have turnover, we are going to the more heavy ones, to the plus ones in the soil. And we also get this enrichment um, from, 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 from yellow. Not uh, uh, and, and we see that the, the lighter ones, the gases are just, just disappearing. So we, we can somehow use this, 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 this isotopes um, also on a landscape scale to, 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 to validate these models in a way and also to look on turnover rates. Now, um, this, this is one slide and this is one of the last ones now. Uh, we can use these stable isotopes also um, because what I said before, we have crop production, we feed animals and there we have the same principles that the nitrogen ending up in the animals will be will be uh, 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 heavier. This is just indicated here. And fish are even on a longer kind of uh, uh, food chain, if you want. So it's, it's enriched. And if you go to, to fruits and, 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 and maize, so it, it's, it's not that heavy. So what we can do with this, and we have done this by collecting fingernails of people. So if you analyze a fingernail, you get a certain C and 15N ratio. And what you see as well is that with with maize and sugarcane, we are approaching to, to heavier uh, 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 certain C values as to fruits and legumes. So if you give me your fingernail and we analyze it, that's the message we can tell you what you eat. And what you see here is that most of the people still eat a lot of meat. So at least in, 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 in this situation. Good. Coming back to this in, in, in a minute. So summary and conclusions. Nitrogen cycle is very complex. We have a lot of different forms, organic, inorganic forms, uh, reactive forms. They are transported uh, along uh, ecosystem compartments. We have excess nitrogen. There's these problems of all these kind of threats to the environment. Um, if you are interested in most of the stuff is really nicely uh, summarized in the European nitrogen assessment. Um, there's these different parts and all of them can be downloaded by uh, there's PDFs, so um, that's quite quite worth if you're interested to have a look to this. Um, now, what, what can we do? Improved and efficiency in plant production with precision farming would be one thing. There's kind of keywords like demand-driven fertilization, optimized timing of management, management actions. That's also one thing what we plan to use the model. So you could, for example, take weather forecast for the next two weeks, three weeks, and you could calculate with this ideal situations when to put the fertilizer. For example, in this uh, South Korean study, we had sandy soils, and if you have a monsoon rain just afterwards, after you put the fertilizer, then it doesn't make that much sense. So that's also one idea. And there's other issues like cover crops, cash crops, and also the storage of these organic fertilizers manure. Uh, they can be done quite quite a lot. Another thing is improved uh, nitrogen efficiency in, in livestock farming. Um, then nitrogen optimized landscape. So I was having this example of riparian zones and we could even also think about where to put a maize field and where to put some bioenergy production system. So we, we could use models in a way to, to, to think a bit more clever rather than to just, just put it there. Energy savings, this was kind of any energy we burn, we produce uh, NOx and reduced meat consumption. So that's maybe the most simple one on a personal level. And now I'm coming really to the last slide is the very, very disappointing thing on this is that black is people from the institute and green it's more like going into in, in, into fish 
No, it's the other way around. So, so green is people from 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 the institute, and black is we had this open day in Garmisch is kind of the the Garmisch population. There was a lot of retired people, so that means even like I told you, and I still know by my own, you should eat less meat. It seems that scientists are eating still more meat, at least in Garmisch, than the local population. And the local population is eating a lot of meat. I don't know if you had the chance to eat a Schweinshaxe, they are as big like this in Garmisch. So the last message is, so it, it's tough, but I think sometimes there's a time for change and anyone can, can do something. Thanks. We do this more and more. So when I started, it was all meat. But if you go to conferences, this is this is more and more going into vegetarian food, which is good. Oh, this is another funny one. I think this is either the dog of Hab, of, of the dog of uh, Alfred. Or the or the cats of HP. I think it's the it's the cats of HP, and so there was some speculation what is in the in the in the the food for for for, for cats. So I think it's the cat of HP because he was keen on knowing what his cats are doing. But this is this is by the way this is this is Klaus. He is living in the tropics, so that means his meat is more produced from maize than from uh, from wheat and and he's eating still a lot of meat so still in Africa you can get this kind of imprint and it, it depends I mean you there's still a history so it's about one year what you get with your with your with your fingernail one thing it was it was yeah somehow related also to Christmas and this kind of higher level of meat could be some bias of Christmas. I, I didn't. Can can you speak a little bit louder? No, 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 no. It's that's what I said. It's 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 about uh, half a year. It's go. It, it's it's a it's an interval of 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 half a year, and there was Christmas in between. So it, it's not that I can tell you what you have eaten uh, uh, yesterday. So what, what, you, what you can do is with hairs you can do it because hairs are much growing, uh, are growing faster than fingernails. So by just knowing um, um, how fast hairs are growing, so in my situation it's difficult, but uh, with, with longer hairs um, you have the chance just, just to, to, to go back and then there, there could be at least some monthly averages. So you should see it if you change from from heavy eating meat to a vegetarian you should see it in the hair after a month or two. Th this is also done I mean the the this isotope things there's more isotopes um this is this is done if you have uh, a, a murdered person they they also look on this on these isotopes sometimes if they if they found a person and no one knows where she was or he was coming from um, if you look on the oxygen and, and water vapor uh, 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 isotopes, you can just tell the climatic conditions where they are. So you can say tropical or European or whatever. So it's 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 and you can use it also like there was this this wine punching issues, and you can use stable isotopes. Also, for example, for champagne, champagne you can only call the champagne if the champagne is really from the champagne region. But because the price for champagne is so high, some people try to sell champagne. And then if you look on the isotopes of water and, and oxygen, you can really say this is the champagne region signal. And if it was coming from US, then uh, it, you would see it. So that's quite, quite, a, quite a nice thing. And we are trying to use it more in, in, also in environmental science and also ratios of isotopes and things. <coughs> 